Welcome to the Armani Talks podcast. I'm your host, Armani Talks. In this podcast, I'm helping you level up your communication skills every Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. If this is your first time on the channel, be sure to hit that subscribe right on below. Hit that like so you can stay updated for the future episodes. And today, we are back for Unapologetic Truths, episode 9. Harsh, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Arman. How are you doing? I'm doing good. And did you notice today's reverse for us? Normally, I'm recording it in the morning on my time, and you're doing it at night. And today, we have it reversed. Yeah, today it's 6 a.m. here, and I think it must be, what, 8 p.m. or something for you? A 7.40 p.m. So you had a reason why you're up this early, right? Yeah, I've been doing something called the 30-day 5 a.m. challenge where for 30 days straight, you have to wake up at 5. And I've been putting up pictures of my watch on Instagram and on Twitter. So that's fine. And I'm like getting in, getting the hang of it. It's like the fourth day today. I recall you doing this a year ago too, right? I do this from time to time. What happens is that, you know, you do it for 30 days, your schedule is set, but over time, your schedule kind of slips away and away and away a little bit at a time, especially for people like me who have like an international business, like affiliate marketing and writing, because you're talking to people who live on the other side of the world. So sometimes you just stay up late to talk to them or have a business meeting that lasts till 11 p.m. And the next day you'll wake up an hour or two late and that kind of pushes your schedule a little bit, little bit, little bit. So you have to do like a reset every six, seven months. So this is my reset this year. Mm -hmm. So are you going to sleep at what, 9 p.m. to wake up at 5 a.m.? That is what will happen in maybe a week. For now, Mm -hmm. my schedule has... it's. So what happens is that you start waking up at 5, you won't immediately start falling asleep at nine what happens is that you will still fall asleep at 11 11 30 and you will be really tired for the first few days but then as time goes on your sleep timing will start falling closer to nine 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 so it's going to be like 10 30 10 9 30 and then nine so currently i'm at the 10 o'clock mark right I recall last year you were posting a watch and I remember eventually more people posting their watches as well, where they were waking up early as well. Are they doing that this year? Yeah, they're doing that this year as well. Because, you know, it's just something that, you know, you know, we are like creatures from a tribe, correct? Like we, we were never meant to live alone and not interact with people. Like we were always supposed to, like humanity always evolved to be in a tribe and to have your brothers and your friends and your family and your uncles next to you. And the internet sort of replaces that now. So on the internet, if I'm posting my watch that everyone can see, that inspires them to do the same thing. And that's a very good thing because then together we can rise. Mm -hmm. We were talking about this where there was this 5 a.m. club from a few years ago that I was a part of. And it motivated me when I would see the Instagram page posting stories early in the morning. And I'm like, yo, I'm not doing this by myself. I'm doing this with a community. Yeah, that really, really helps. Okay, If you have, for for example, if you take me, I'm not doing this alone. I have some friends who are doing it with me, like some of my business, business associates, and they like Telegram message me a hello in the morning. And that's something that keeps you, you know, accountable. So for example, if it's 5 a.m. and I don't feel like waking up, And I actually go back to sleep. I know that all of my business associates will know that I didn't do it today. And it's going to be a bit shameful and, you know, embarrassing for me. So Mm -hmm. I'm not someone and no one is someone who likes being embarrassed. So I'll wake up at five, like no matter what, like even if I'm feeling really tired, I like that people respect me more than I like, say, sleeping an extra hour. So Mm -hmm. that really helps. Having a community strictly helps. And if I would strongly recommend someone who's doing this to find someone else to do it with them. And if that is not possible, 
then do it on the internet. Like post your images, post your watch on the internet for everyone to see. Do you have a mantra for this? Watch mm-hmm. gang or 5 a.m. club? <laughs> I should come up with <laughs> one. I, I forgot. I, the idea never even occurred to me. Watch gang. You should. Something like that. Uh, there was this moment, I would say, my sophomore year in college. Uh, there was a problem that I had, which I still do, where I lose weight quickly while one of my fraternity brothers he weight, he gains weight quickly. So he'll eat a donut and he'll gain five pounds. I won't eat a meal. I'll lose five pounds. How I'm exaggerating a little bit. What is your maintenance? My maintenance is, I would say, 2,200 calories. How much do you but, weigh? That's low. Yeah, this was... Okay, so I'm talking about the sophomore year of college. So I, I weighed... I weighed light, dude. I was probably 172, 175. How much is that in kg weight? One seventy two is, I think, about like eighty kg. Man, man, you know we don't do kg over here. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, I think that say. should be like seventy eight kg. No, no, no. Problem. I'm, 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 I'm still six a.m. in the morning. I'm, my math is not that good. So got to divide by two and then minus ten percent. So one seventy five yeah. by two, two is what I think eighty seven point five minus an eighty kg. I suppose like around eighty kg. Right, right. So basically, he, my fraternity brother, would gain weight quickly. I would lose weight quickly. And this was our problem for some time. And I don't know whose idea it was, but one day we created a bet to see who could get ripped first. And that was our goal. Who can get to this much body fat percentage first? And we were going to give ourselves five to six months to do it. The loser was going to get roasted by our fraternity. And (laughs) pretty much what do you call it had to take the winner out for dinner but simply knowing that there was a bet on the line bro we worked hard and by the end of the bet the end of the six months you know your boy won however my fraternity brother did not look like a loser he was shredded as well so it was it's just a good way to show that competition can inspire men to bring out their best selves I definitely agree, and congrats to your friend and you as well. I think that, that thank you. There are men do get motivated by you know winning. So, for example, if you are say you're singing or you know you're doing anything, let's say, let's take the same example. If you gamify it, you will be more serious about it because you know now you have competition. Otherwise, mm-hmm. you get into the thought of, you know, I might lose, say, one kg per month or two kg per month. What difference does it make? I'll get there eventually. And But when you have, like, someone competing with you, then it's like, there's no time to waste. I got to do the best thing. Right. And it's a friendly competition, too, where my fraternity brother, his name was Sonny. We're just joking around, like, yo, Tubby, you better not be eating that donut today because you want to make sure you're not embarrassing yourself. And here's the thing. We even made it higher stakes, Harsh, because at the end, we had to post our shirtless pictures on Facebook, and we had to see who the general public said had the better body. So this is our freshman year in college, dude, and the stakes were pretty high. Um, We both had a good amount of uh, Facebook friends, so we didn't want to look like the loser in front of our squad. And at the end of it all, Harsh, it bonded us. To this day, him and I still talk about it. I went to his wedding, I would say, two years ago. And this is a moment for us where we use it as a moment for rapport. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Uh, Do you have a moment like that uh, with one of your friends? Where a friendly bet turned into something more? Not particularly. Not that I can think of. I would say no. Well, it's good that you still have a squad that you can wake up early in the morning with. I like to call those habit buddies. <laughs> See, in my case, they're mostly my business associates, you know, because even they are into productivity and getting more out of their life. And not all of them, but a good portion of them want to do, you know, whatever that helps them do more in their day, which involves waking up early, having an accountability group and things of that sort. Right. And I think this 
transitions us well to one of the tweets, Harsh, that you tweeted on November 13th. I look like a stalker right now, uh, pulling up your tweets. Okay, so this is called <laughs> <laughs> Two Young People. Success doesn't come from fitting in. It comes from ascending. You don't want to be like those people around you. You want to own and conquer them. Rise higher. And this was one of your popular tweets. Did you want to break this one down? Hmm. Uh, when I was a kid, I remember my father telling me, and I think the conversation was something like um, me telling my dad that I wanted to go to someone's birthday party or something. And my dad saying, why do you want to go? And me telling him that, you know, if I don't go, I won't have friends. And, you know, I want to be friends with everyone and, you know, fit in with people. And he said to me that um, this is like I'm translating from Hindi here. So he said something along the lines of um, you don't want to put your feet into the dirt right now because you have the rest of your life ahead of you. And if you get stuck here, how will you move forward? So like his advice basically meant that you shouldn't have um like very strong sticky type of friends you need to have like transient friends you can learn from and then move away from so that's what he was trying to mm-hmm. communicate and you know at that age i just didn't get it you know at that age i was like what are you talking about and you know i was you know throwing mm-hmm. a hasty fit i think i was like eight years <laughs> old or something so yeah that's what he said and then he gave me an example that you don't want to be like you know because that party was supposed to be at late in the night and my dad didn't want me to stay up that late and uh, m- uh, my answer was my was that I want to really go so that, you know, I'll have fun. It's late in the night and I've never done it before. And my dad said that you don't want to be like them, like because they're like dirt. Mo- you don't want to be like the dirt. You want to be like the lotus who grows from the dirt and, you know, you want to be better. So that has been... That has been very profound for me throughout my life where I think to an extent and not completely back then at least, but over time, I just stopped caring about fitting in in the sense that, you know, what 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 do most people want to do? They want to be like everyone, like everyone. They're all doing the same thing because they're all doing it. Like, for example, if you take wearing a jacket, if everyone's wearing a jacket, then most people will want to wear a jacket. On Twitter, everyone's putting up images of, you know, laser eyes to communicate how much they love Bitcoin. And I haven't done that yet for the same reason. It's just, I don't try to fit in anymore. And the reason is that when you try to fit in, you become like the people around you. And then how can you be better better than them? So the, the goal is not to fit in with people, although it is beneficial to appear like you're fitting in, but the goal is to rise above people. So if you have, say, back in my school, I remember all the cool kids, okay? I remember that they were very popular and, you know, they would get attention from everybody. And I Were wouldn't. you a cool kid? No, <laughs> I was the anti-cool okay. kid. I was gotcha. one of the most uncool, nerdy kids in school. I was really smart, but I was didn't have any social skills. And, Mm -hmm. you know, back then, yeah, those guys were like gods of those days, I would say, like at least in that school. And today, most of them are irrelevant. I had like a couple of them reach out to me and I just didn't even, I wouldn't even accept a meeting with them because it would be a waste of my time. So it's just that you don't want to be someone who fits into the people you're around. You want to be someone who keeps getting better. You want to rise and ascend and conquer. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm communicating this correctly. Like you don't want to like go and kill them, but you want to like become so much better than them that these people are just beneath, you know, and you should keep doing that at every level you are. So now that you're better, now you should strive to become even more better and even better and even better. And right. You you should never try to be like, oh, I've achieved what I wanted and now I'll just fit in with this group. You should always strive to get better. Would you say in this sort of scenario, Harsh, is good to not be popular, especially in in that age where you're trying to figure yourself out, like middle school, high school? 
I think that popularity is something that people choose in the sense that most people who are popular are actually working at being popular. Like they're figuring out what is the most cool thing to wear, what is the most cool thing to say, and what are the most popular opinions to have, how to present themselves. So they aren't popular naturally, at least that's how I think. I think that a lot of them are putting in a lot of time and attention and energy into staying and being popular. And so popularity is something that you choose. It's not something that comes for free. And even celebrities work really hard to stay relevant and popular. Like it doesn't come for free for sure. And I think that chasing popularity at any point of time is kind of a waste unless you are someone who is like an influencer or, you know, a celebrity or something like that. Someone who can, you know, turn that popularity to cash or a politician. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't think that for most people, popularity is like a good thing. It kind of fucks with their head and you see that all the time. Okay, You you see all these singers who are like really popular when they were like younger, like 17, 16. But as they kept growing older and they had this insane amount of popularity, it kind of gets in your head and, you know, they get into like weird and bad habits like drugs and illicit sex and that happens with a lot of child, yeah, a lot of child these, actors. Not just child actors. I think if you take some people like, um, if you take popular singers, okay, especially in pop, because pop is like one of the most famous places, but even in say heavy metal rock, you will find that a, almost all of them have had some kind of drug problem or depression. And most of them are like divorced multiple times. And it's just something that is not good for you. Yeah, because when you think about it, Harsh, what is celebrity really? It's as though there's tons and tons of information technology on you, where the sort of popularity that you were talking about in, what was that, high school or middle school that you were sharing that story from? Middle I think school? the problem is really the same. Like, it's just a different scale. I'll tell you what, okay, when you are very popular, what happens is that you know, the human tendency is to feel like, hey, all these people like me and respect me. Therefore, I must be amazing. And because I'm amazing, why do I need to listen to anyone else? Why do I need to keep trying to get better? I'm already the best. So let me just do what I want. And what I want and what I do is the right way because I'm doing it. Do you get me? I do get you. Have you ever heard of Andre 3000? I have not. So he is one half of the highly popular what do you call it, rap group, outcast. And people who listen to hip hop will say that Andre 3000 is probably the top 10 lyricists out there. And you would imagine that this guy would love it because he gets so much respect and so much critical acclaim for his skill set. But he had this interview recently where he was talking about his meteoric rise with outcast made him feel so secluded. And for the past, I would say, five to eight years, he hasn't been consistently releasing music. And it's a shame because people would, I mean, if he releases an album right now, even though he hasn't released an album in five to seven years, I'm still sure that it's going to go platinum. But he's just so haunted by fame where he doesn't like it, where he goes out, he gets recognized. People want his autograph when he's going to use the restroom. Um, it's pretty shocking because he goes in detail regarding it where you don't often see the behind the scenes stuff too much but i hear he's uh, going to be doing more interviews in regarding to, in regards to that mm, that's interesting i would say that popularity of that type for it popular with the general public is the worst well, like i did want to ask you about that because you're from the the dc region where I hear over there, Bollywood stars are seen as gods yeah, within the culture. I think that yeah, they are, but that's kind of exaggerated. I think that only there's a portion of very low IQ people who will literally worship them. And when I say literally worship them, I mean like they will make a temple, put a photo mm-hmm. of them and then start worshiping them. And that's not <laughs> super common, at least not where I am from. But there are very, very low IQ people here in India and a lot of them do this and it is just how it is. Like if you're worshipping a human, you're low IQ. I'll just like 
that's like i'll just tell you that up front like if you're worshiping someone who was a human and he was alive as a person he had flesh and blood you're an idiot so what do you call it you heard of the ifa awards the ifa awards is basically when a bunch of the bollywood um i think it's a bollywood movie award and a few years ago they had it in tampa and one of my friends was just like yo i got an extra ticket do you want to come with me and i thought might as well so i'm going there i see a bunch of these bollywood stars like anil kapoor rithik roshan uh, i don't know if salman khan was there a bunch of random uh, of the people as well and dude there were people breaking cages uh, stomping uh, doing the stampede trying to see these people and i'm like damn guys you guys love them that much i just like being there just because of a social event but these people were creating a stampede i think that anyone see here's the here's this okay like if you go back in history and i don't even mean like ancient history i mean like just before the whole glamour era you will find that acting was considered to be not a respectable profession because you're not you're just an entertainer correct you're not adding that much value to society and it wasn't it wasn't like considered to be something that was particularly um people would want to be and you know but today now that our culture has evolved a lot i think the value of glamour has risen dramatically okay if you take if you take if you go if you read some older books you will find that if you take women okay women who wanted to be you know in the club and they wanted to be the, you know they wanted to have the spotlight this was considered to be a vice for women like women would want that of course because you know they're, they're women but it was not considered to be a good thing but nowadays it's like accepted and it's considered to be if a woman is like the star of the show in a club like she's dancing really well and getting all the attention that's considered to be like an achievement for her now but back then it was considered to be a vice because she was wanting attention and now that our culture has evolved i think that this is just across the scope in the sense that people people aren't worshiping anything like strength and you know any higher order virtues like purity intelligence um uh say divine virtue or you know god or whatever okay they're worshiping literal glamour like when they're worshiping all these celebrities they're worshiping glamour and that's where we are as a society today like people worship glamour and not all societies are like that you know like some society like if you take um, at, le- at least from what i understand there are societies where god still is important but nowadays it's just at least in india and i, I would bet in the us as well it's just glamour 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 and it's you know f- fine like we're in decline it's okay like i get it like it's a cultural decline i'm okay with it i've made my peace <laughs> do you why do you think they're worshiping glamour it's because of a lack of culture it's the only thing they value so for example if you take i'll let, let's go back in history okay let's say sparta for example what did the spartans value spartans were literally people who valued strength physical strength so if a baby is born and the baby is not strong they will kill the baby and they would literally prevent weak men from breeding in the sense that it was expected that if you're not very strong that you are you would like get someone else who's strong and fit and you know who would have a good son and you would have that guy impregnate your wife and it was considered to be a bad thing for people who you know are very possessive about their women so spartans worshiped strength and the strongest warriors were respected and things like that and different civilizations have had different things they completely respected but generally it was always productivity creativity um strength um purity and things like that and today our culture has evolved where these things don't really people don't really respect them so you might be like really strong but people don't give a shit but the only thing people respect now is glamour and glamour so 
if you take someone who is an actor actors have a ton of glamour singers have a ton of glamour if you ask a kid what they want to be today they'll tell you i want to be like a tiktok influencer and kids at least when i was younger they would want to be uh, you know astronauts and that kind of goes to show that as a society we're going down to glamour and even parents are teaching their children to love glamour so if a kid is young they'll tell him that hey don't you want to meet this uh, cricketer or someone and you're they're teaching their children that glamour is the most important thing and having a fan following is the definition of success when it really isn't do you think harsh that's a that's a different way of looking at another tweet you posted which is uh, this is the renaissance period where creative individuals gain more power over institutions oh, uh, i don't want to read the whole thing that's a different way of looking at it but what i was trying mm-hmm. to communicate there was the declining trust in institutions so for example 10 years ago if you saw something on the news you would believe it oh, w- w- one quick sec harsh let me just finish reading the tweet just so oh, sorry. cuz i think you uh, no no i i think you're about to drop like a truth bomb r- real quick so <laughs> all right folks so i'm reading one of harsh's tweets from november 9th so basically how it goes is uh, this is the renaissance period where creative individuals gain more power over institutions there are individuals who have a bigger audience and more trust than news channels rogan pudipi musk etc this is the most exciting time to be alive get a piece of the pie that's a tweet hmm yeah so what i was trying to communicate with that tweet was that institutions today have just lost any kind of trust and they're fucked basically institutions are fucked and if you take if you go back 10 years ago when you watch the news arman did you believe the news 10 years ago yeah 10 years ago i did yeah you did right but when you see the news today do you believe it hell no exactly and that is a situation that's kind of like we're going in that direction where trust in all kind of established institutions whether you take say the cdc or you know universities or the news and the government and all of these institutions are failing even marriage is failing and that is going to be replaced by trustworthy individuals or individuals who have built a reputation over time for example if you take you and me i bet there are people who trust us way more than they trust the news and that's because over time we have shown that we're credible and if we show in the future if we start cheating people then that credibility will be lost so it's just how the world is moving because these institutions have lied and you know their lies have been exposed because of the internet mm-hmm. it gives an opportunity for individuals to shine because today is the only time where everyone can have a voice before twitter facebook and social media most people just wouldn't have a voice like there the only voice that existed was the news channel news channel Um, yeah harsh i would go ahead go sorry ahead. well i would say just to add on to your point 10 to 15 years ago if someone was saying oh you can't believe what's on the news they're not for the people we'd look at these people sort of like they were crazy ah this is a conspiracy theorist right now while well, nowadays if people are saying everything on the news is believable if you don't believe it then you're crazy we'd look at this person as though he's been brainwashed <laughs> right isn't it crazy correct same thing with same thing in india to a lesser extent in the younger population it's definitely there and i know that because i was talking to this girl who was like 15 years old like a family friend and i mentioned the news and she goes up to me and says point blank that all news is fake <laughs> that's intense Yeah that really is especially from a girl because you know girls are more likely to be you know more um more likely to be influenced by the institutions Well there's one of um there's this guy that I knew uh from college and he's sort of like me and you we're we're pretty aware of you can't trust everything that's on the mainstream media but a few months back his business ended up failing so he had to move back with his parents and he told me that for the 4 months that he lived with his parents every single day cnn was playing from morning to night 
And he would just say that his parents were so scared. And him being in that house started to physically make him feel different. Isn't that strange? Where you physically feel different from being pounded mainstream media in your mind routinely? Yeah, I would say that that's to be expected. And I would say that because, you know, when you are, say, stressed because of fear or whatever, your body is releasing hormones that make you scared and, you know, make you want to fight back or hide or whatever, okay? And continuously having that flow through your body is going to mess you up in ways you can't imagine over time. How is your friend doing now? So basically, my friend, he moved back from his parents' crib and nowadays he's living by himself and he's invested in a bookshelf and he does not watch the mainstream media. So he's feeling a lot better, Harsh. Hmm. See, isn't that so easy to feel better? Just stop watching the news. But people, oh. I'll tell you what, look, if you take your family, your friend's family, who's actually believing the news? The people who grew up in an environment where they, th- they thought the news was trustworthy. So even today, the people who truly watch the news are boomers. Like, you know, I don't know. I think boomers are like people who are like 60 and above. Right. Yeah, so these older people are the ones who are watching the news and actually believing it. But someone who's 25, 30, they don't give a shit what the news has to say. So the news could say like, and they have like, I think I've had like many articles on me calling me a misogynist and no one gives a shit because it just, you know. <laughs> But had it's it been fun. like 15 years ago, then I would be in trouble. So did Huffington Post by any chance ever write something on you? Yeah, they uh, wrote an article calling me, you know, a pile of garbage and a misogynist. And they misspelled my name twice in the same articles. They called me Life <laughs> Matt Monday. And some they, they made two spelling errors. So one time they called me Life Math Monday and the other one was Life Meth Monday or something. A meth, so, like the drugs? I don't remember. Let me. So what happened to the Huffington Post in India was that it shut down. So I don't even have the article now. I have a screenshot lying somewhere that I posted on Twitter making fun of them. So yeah, I, you know, for a while, for, for like a day or two, I was a little mad about it. But then I was like, nothing is going to come of it. These people are complete morons. They couldn't even proofread their own article. And I did some research into who actually writes these articles. And turns out they're like interns. So these interns are paid to like like very small amounts to just churn out articles. And these companies have like nine employees. So Huffington Post India had eight employees and all they were doing was sitting in their office and writing articles. So how can you be a news organization if you're not even going out and actually finding things out? If you're just sitting in your office and going on Twitter and saying, this is happening on Twitter and <laughs> just giving like a completely Breaking one-sided news. opinion. So for example, there was a tweet that a lot of people really like, but some people really hated. So instead of saying that a lot of people really like this tweet and some people hate it, they said this tweet is like burning Twitter and this tweet sucks, this guy's an idiot and he's evil. And they quoted tweets. They basically only quoted one side of the picture. They literally did not quote a single tweet that was like positive and they quoted all the negative tweets. So it's fake news. It's basically Huffington Post is fake news. And... It shut down in India. Like they have no business anymore, and you go to their website, it's shut down, and that has to be because no one's actually using it. Oh, it's completely done now. It's com- at least in India, in it's India, completely it's- done. Yeah, it's completely done. Okay, the reason I was asking Harsh, and you may want, you may like to hear this news, because when I was uploading our first ever episode, there's a few auto suggestions for the keywords that we could put. And mm-hmm. one of them was Life Math Money Huffington Post. So I believe our first ever Unapologetic Truths episode is ranking for their keyword now. <laughs> oh, that's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's a lot of newspapers like that who are like mostly fake news. Because so you, you have know, a first-hand experience with this. I have a first-hand experience with this. I think this has happened to me like three or four times with different news outlets where they just publish like, a very one-sided opinion that's just meant to, you know, hurt my reputation. And it's funny that I have more viewers and readers than them. That's insane. Like, because I, I'm three times man, or man. four times bigger than what Huffington India was when they were in their prime. There was another time, Harsh, where 
there was a pretty big account that gave you a shout out and you started to get some backlash for that right mm-hmm. yeah he was a tech founder in india pretty cool guy man you must have had the chance to network with a lot of uh, big people uh, from different parts of the world due to the size of your account right yeah that has happened i think that must be the case with you as well i think that you know it's like when you are on twitter and you are on the internet you're posting your thoughts and people will want to get in touch with you right and for anyone that's thinking about writing tweets i would say it's high roi if you're talking about something that you embody and let me just give you a quick little story harsh mm-hmm. so i was reading this a beginners investors book by robert kiyosaki and Rich within Dad, the book no it's his third book on investing okay and throughout the book he keeps mentioning this one author and i was looking at the author's name and i'm like man this guy looks super familiar his name because it sticks out but that's when i'm like nah i'm probably just overthinking it later on that day i'm tweeting some thoughts and then i start getting this one person posting memes on one of my tweets and i see the person that's posting the memes i'm like wait a minute this name looks familiar so i look at his name and the name that robert kiyosaki was bringing up in the book and i'm like whoa it's the same exact guy so i click the guy who posted the meme and he's following me as well <laughs> what's the name so his name man i don't want to butcher his name but let me say it uh he's one of the accounts i'm following okay so his last name is big jim oshanasi oh jim oshanasi i've spoken to him before pretty cool guy yeah. very very smart very smart and i started following him and i thought wow what a small world i'm reading a book the book recommends a person and this person is following me on twitter <laughs> and now i'm following them back <laughs> is that crazy isn't that cool uh, yeah <laughs> that's amazing so how what what did you like what went through your head like whoa dude my mind was blown because here's my thing i wrote a tweet about this recently harsh where i said coincidences seem just like coincidences when you explain it to another person but coincidences feel like something divine when it's happening to you and i thought what's the likelihood of that happening it's so random where at that exact moment when i'm reading the book i'm getting this gentleman posting a meme on one of my tweets i'm thinking the likelihood of that happening is so tiny so my mind was blown let me just put it like that <laughs> that's really really cool and you know that's going to happen more and more to us because we're growing our accounts to a very large extent that we're going to reach more and more people so um if you i have like more accounts than just like math money correct i have like a army of small bot accounts like chanakya bot and 48 laws of power bot and i was just going through the top followers from this software that i use and i had i found that a lot of actual lawmakers and politicians are following us like they're following our accounts so i like to think that we have an impact on making the world literally better by essentially putting the right ideas in the heads of the people who are making the decisions yes and that's a good segue harsh because the ideas that a person does entertain is a large part of who they are what do you think about that How important do you think ideas are to a culture? I think they're one of the most important things because ideas are what forms beliefs and beliefs are how you act and what decisions you make. I think that ideas are really really important and a culture that is devoid of ideas is going to stagnate. And a culture that entertains say, too many wrong ideas is going to basically kill itself if you take the west right now that's what's happening correct you have basically the wrong ideas you have like this whole theory of racism and you know lgbt and children needing hormones and you have too many bad ideas going on there and it's going to fuck them up my perception of education is that it should empower you it should make you feel 8 inches taller after you're done learning and if you're learning something that's making you feel oppressed you're feeling 8 inches shorter then most <laughs> likely you shouldn't be learning this too much 
this isn't adding practical value to your life. It's one thing if you want to stay updated, but it's another thing if you're just wrapping your identity around it. I think that in universities in the West and even some universities here in India, um, we had leftist academic professors essentially take over. So if you ask, and this is on Twitter, okay, I know a couple of professors and they will literally tell you that we're not trying to debate racism, we're just trying to solve it. And if you can't debate something, then you basically accepted this to be truth. And at that point, you're like, this isn't university anymore. This is an indoctrination center because if you can't debate something, then it's indoctrination. It's like religion. Mm-hmm. Like, have you watched this clip? So there's this guy called Atlas. Do you know who Atlas is? What's his name? Atlas on Twitter. Atlas. Dentist uh, Leo. Yes, I, I've seen his account before with a lion. Yeah, with a lion. Pretty cool guy. Right. So he posted this video of some guy on TV, okay? And this seems to be like a Muslim country. And in this Muslim country, there's this guy on TV and he says that, you know, he doesn't believe in God. He's an atheist, okay? But then these two show hosts, they start attacking him like brutally. They start telling him that he needs a psychiatrist and what is wrong with him and tell him where he came from. And and this guy's trying to explain that there are many theories like the Big Bang and these two people aren't having any of it. They're like just attacking him straight, like, they're not up for debate. They, they just have this belief that this system of, you know, whatever their religion is, is true. And they're not willing to take any debate whatsoever. So it's an indoctrination center. And that's what universities have become. So if you're not someone who believes in, you know, racism and sexism and, you know, the whole LGBT and transgenders and people can change their gender, whatever crap they have going on is true, then you are the enemy. Well, that's where one thing that I lucked out in, Harsh, where I was in a highly hard skills dominant side where you had to be super ideal. What do you, what's the word? Ideologue? Where you're soup, where you're trying to get someone to think your ideas. Um, Whatever. Let's just go with perfect. ideologue. Yeah. L- where I was in such a hard skills field where we weren't talking about uh, the politics too much. So I would say I was sheltered away from that in my undergrad degree. But nowadays, man, I'm uh, Facebook physics, friends. Correct? I studied electrical engineering. Yeah, I don't think that the hard sciences have too much of an issue because, you know, that's where competence matters. So it's like, you, regardless of your political opinion, you still have to know how light is going to move and how electricity goes from, you know, less electrons to more electrons or something like that. And right. So I wasn't too aware of how divided certain parts of college was. Where nowadays, Harsh, uh, you know, I became Facebook friends with a few of my university professors because they were pretty cool people. And one of the professors, he's this English guy. He taught English and he is so freaking political on Facebook where he's calling people out. He's having these big block paragraph debates with a different Facebook friends. And I'm thinking, man, this is the guy who is teaching me English class as a prereq in undergrad. So is that something that you experienced as well uh, when you were in undergrad? I never went to undergrad. <laughs> oh, you never went to undergrad? No, I had. I'm, I did. I, the last time I went to, um, uh, you know, an education institution to study was in my 12th grade, so high school. Dude, this actually ties into another... I'm a chartered accountant, and that is a distance education course. Yeah, and, and this ties into a tweet that I had pulled up for you, where I did want you to break it down and let you know, uh, let people know what you meant by this, which, even though it's highly direct, I believe you could add more to it. Mm-hmm. I, and this is this is the tweet. I do one to two online courses every month. It doesn't matter what the topic is. Databases, photography editing, writing, web dev, whatever. I want to learn. If some expert in their field will teach me their hard-earned knowledge for $200, it's a steal, and I'll take that over and over. Now, before you give your thoughts on that, Harsh, I want to hear yours. Mo- well, it gives me more perspective, knowing that you never went to undergrad, because I believe 
now you have more of a thirst for knowledge where if you did go to undergrad, I'm not saying that you won't be as curious, but just to give you an analogy, let's say there's two brothers. One brother stayed at home and he always got fed while there's another brother who got kicked out at a younger age and he had to hunt for his food. The one that had to hunt is going to be more adept in getting the right food. So I personally learned something new about you. Um, I didn't know you didn't go to undergrad, but now this tweet takes up a different context to me. Uh, did you want to add anything from your perspective? Mm, it's just that doing courses has helped me in more ways than one. Not only does it increase in knowledge, it also helps you out in business. And it helps you out in like the ways you don't understand when you're actually learning. And I'll give you an example of that, okay? If you take, when I learned how to code, I, after doing that, I had so many more ideas in my head for my business. So if you take, after I learned how to code, it occurred to me that I can automate my Twitter account. So I can make more Twitter accounts. I can just load up tweets, like code, book quotes or whatever. And I can just do that automatically. So these are ideas that never even occurred to me before I had, you know, learned how to code. And now this is something that makes me a very good amount of money every month without me having to do anything. So, and even with other courses, I've had similar experiences. For example, if I did a course on essentially what makes photos look good and that helped me say, make my website look better. And that, that helped me take better photographs and, you know, be more presentable in photographs. So those things really help. The, then I did a course on, I did so many courses that you just don't even like, I can't even remember them all. I did a course on how to text women. You know, I did a course on, and these are like cheap Gumroad courses. Sometimes they're on UAdMe and, you know, Coursera or whatever. And they cost like 20 bucks, 200 bucks or something like that. It, it's very variable. I did a course on SEO and that helped me get more viewers to the website. So all of these courses, they add up, they help you, they increase your knowledge, they help you in your business, and they make you a more complete person. And I think that everyone should be doing courses. And I think that people are just, their mentality is too, too low level because people will not do a course simply because of the price tag. So if a course costs 200 bucks, they won't do it. And that doesn't make any sense to me. If something can make you $200,000, why wouldn't you spend 200 bucks? There are people who won't buy a book for 20 bucks. Like there's a book called Poor Charlie's Almanac, Almanac, and that book costs like $100, or I think it costs, in some places it costs like $500, and I, I remember paying a, quite a bit of cash for it. And people will not buy that book simply because it's expensive. But that book is written by a legit billionaire why wouldn't you want to buy it? It makes no sense whatsoever to me. I have a copy and I I love the book. So it just it's just one of those things that I feel that have had a big impact on my own success. Do you do a lot of courses, Arman? Yes. So for me personally, I will invest in a Gumroad course. And have you heard of Skillshare? I have. I used to affiliate with them a while ago. Right. So I teach a f few classes on Skillshare, Hirsch, and I decided to look through it to see what other classes they have. And it's predominantly creative classes, uh, such as doing uh, Photoshop, creative writing, poetry, uh, blogging, etc. And I found that interesting. So Skillshare is another platform. Uh, Udemy gets my curiosity every now and then. But to answer your question, Yes, I invest in courses. Uh, one thing that I used to hear from people is, well, why am I going to buy a course for $200 when I could get the same material from a bunch of different books? It and I personally, long. yeah, and I personally never got that mentality because I don't think they need to be compared. I still read books and whenever I can invest in a course to make myself smarter, it's not rocket science. I'm going to do it. And I think more people should start thinking like that, where nowadays, 
people are pessimistic, in my opinion, regarding the wrong things. Are there some bad courses? Sure. Of course. Are are there some bad books? Sure. Are there bad anything? Yes. And that's up to you as hopefully a modern day autodidact who's going to search for the right knowledge. A big part of self-education, Harsh, in my opinion, is not to be spoon-fed the right information. A bigger part is learning how to get the right information. It's called information gathering. So I believe throughout your journey, throughout so my journey. How did how do you decide whether something is good or not? So how do you what is your filtering system? So I start off with myself first. My thing is, do I need this? So for example, <clears throat> what's a good example? Let me think of the last course that I took. So one of the last courses I took, Harsh, was by Jose Rosado. It's called Crash Course Gumroad. Mm, you know I, Jose, I, right? I did, I did that course. It's a good course. Yeah, it's like and an it's so si- video, correct? Right. And it's so simple and to the point. He teaches you how to set up a workflow. He teaches you how to give follow-up emails. And he even gives you uh, click five stars or rate the product. And I could immediately tell it was good because there was a problem and he g- gave the resolution for it. He didn't make it confusing at all. And overall, I learned more about Gumroad through that. So that's just one of the examples, Harsh. And I've taken much more courses where this one is to the point. It's efficient. Where let's say you're trying to take a course on body language. This one is going to be more subjective. Mm. So the more subjective it is. that you brought up body language because a business associate of mine is working on a course on body language. And I'm a partner in that and I'm going to help promote it. Oh, are you? Oh, yeah. So we were literally just going to discuss the material for that course after this call. And that's going to be an important topic, Harsh, because more people want to put themselves out there. And just to, for a little bit more context, is it body language for guys or unisex? It's a general course on body language. So for example, if you take, um, if you take, it's one thing to know how to read body language, but also how to have the right body language. So it it encompasses everything that we know about body language from our experience in consulting and, you know, women and things like that. It's, it's, it's a, it's a unisex course, but it's kind of because we're men, it's kind of going to be more for men. Right. And for a course like this, since it's more subjective, the audience or the consumer has to participate more where a course on Gumroad, for example, it teaches you exactly what to do. So it's pretty much the audience doesn't have to participate as much. They're given solid instructions from the instructor. Where in your case, since it's subjective, the person has to participate to tell whether or not the material is great or not. And that's where I think a lot of people fail, Harsh, where they think that just consuming the course is enough. I consumed it. I should have results. I'm like, no, buddy. You, you don't just consume action. it. You got to apply it. You got to integrate it into your life. Then you can have an opinion on the matter. Yeah, that that's a somewhat of a problem. I think a lot of people just don't want to take action. And I have that every once in a while, okay? I'll have someone who will buy my course on Twitter, and the art of Twitter. And they'll send me an email saying that I read the course. I applied it for two days. And I don't have a big account yet. And I'm like, what were you expecting? You applied for two days, it's going to take like <laughs> at least a year, six months at least. And what so did they say? They're shocked. They expect it to do, they expect it to be like surgery. Okay. Like the problem is fixed. Like, you know, you have like a tumor and you get the tumor cut out and now you're fine. They mm-hmm. expect it to be like that instead of like, you know, losing weight, which is like, it takes time. You have to work every single day. And that's, that's what people need to understand, where courses aren't some sort of magic pill, where you take it and problem solved. You got to apply it. You got to be consistent. And then people should have an opinion. Where nowadays, Harsh, I think even taking people's advice or opinion on matters is risky. Where I had this one guy from a couple of years back talking about this one particular book, and he was vehemently against it. He's like, If I were you, I would not read that book. Trust me, it's not worth it. 
And a couple of weeks later, I found out he only read three chapters. I'm thinking, oh, man, why the hell do you have such an opinion on the book if you only read three chapters? I don't think that's completely invalid, though, because if a book sucks, you can sometimes just tell. Like I read this oh, so, book, oh. I read I read half of this book, and it's a very popular book. It's it's a it, there's a guy called uh, David Goggins, and he he has a book called I forgot the name of the book. You can't hurt me. Yeah, you can't can't hurt me. Correct. So I listened to half the audiobook, and it was like a it was a book that I just couldn't get into. So my recommendation would be against that book. So it's just something. Sometimes you can just tell whether this product is enjoyable or not. So harsh. I have a different philosophy on that. Where my philosophy is, if I get just one great idea from a book, then it was worth it. And for me personally, there were a few books where I despised the beginning, but in that last twenty five percent, it started to spit some fire. So it changed my entire perception, and the book was worth it. Hmm. I think that there are books like that. Okay. It's like it's like food. Okay. Like sometimes you can just tell by having the first bite that this dish sucks. But sometimes you just gotta like eat a bit and get let your tongue get used to it, and then you'll start liking it. So if you take, I had something like salted ice cream before. Have you ever had salted ice cream? Yes, so, with caramel too. Uh, it, I think it was chocolate, and the concept was that they put very little sugar in the ice cream, but they add salt to it. So w- the little sugar also starts tasting very sweet. Uh huh. So initially, when I my friend bought it, he paid like twenty dollars or something. And I was like, "What are you doing?" And I had a bite, and I was, I was a little shocked, and you know, like this ice cream sucks. I but did. my friend told me, "Just just eat more of it." So I kept taking small bites, and you know, like in like say after I ate like ten percent of the ice cream, my tongue had gotten used to the salt. And now I couldn't really taste much of the salt, and the ice cream was very good. So I think that I, I get what you're trying to tell me that sometimes you just have to let it happen. But sometimes you can just tell in the beginning that this is not good. And I for th- me, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Well, for me personally, from the food you were just mentioning, my version of that is sweet potatoes. Did you ever try that? I love sweet potatoes. Like roasting them and eating them is the best. Especially so, in the winter. Yeah, so growing up, I hated sweet potatoes, dude. I would spit it out. And people would be shocked because they never heard someone say that sweet potatoes suck. And they never saw my reaction, where it was of disgust. And eventually, some people were like, dude, you got to cook it better. And you got to eat the whole thing. Or just finish your chew. Where I kept spitting it out too quick. And once I was finishing my chew... I noticed that the beginning part I didn't like, but it ended well for me. Mm. So nowadays I'll eat sweet potatoes. Yeah, sweet potatoes are good. Yeah, I think that sometimes it's a mistake to just abandon things too quickly. It really depends. Okay, knowing the art of quitting is a science. Knowing the art of quitting is a science. That's that's deep. Should make that a tweet. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, I completely agree with you that you have to be careful who you take your advice from. And I'll give you a different perspective on that, okay? And I, this is something that like was a little mind-blowing to me. Have you heard of GPT-3? No. It's a machine learning program that writes articles and text messages and tweets for you. And a lot of people are using it nowadays. So... If you go go on Twitter and search for uh, Naval GPT three, Naval GPT three underscore Naval. Uh huh. And read the tweets, okay? And you will find that a lot of the almost all the tweets made by GPT three, they sound a lot. They sound very human, and they kind of sound legit. So if you take this tweet okay the most important life hack is to not die and you know if buddha said it if i if i make the same quote and i say this is something that was said by benjamin franklin then you'll be like oh this is a very deep inside it's very good and it's just something that was written by a machine who doesn't even have any life experience 
So if you take say this, there's just a lot of these tweets here. If you take, if you're gonna spend a lot of time on something, make it something that's gonna add value to your life. Okay, big dreams don't work unless you do. So all of these tweets are made by a machine. Like you don't choose your passions, your passions choose you. Do not resist. And you know you would like if you if this was something. If I say you don't choose your passions, your passions choose you. Do not resist. And I say dash Lao Tzu or the Buddha or something like that. And this will be like a very deep thought, correct? <laughs> yeah, right. But this is just a machine, so it's important to remember that just because something sounds eloquent does not make it true. It's very important to consider the source of where your information is coming from nowadays, because your brain is kind of going is your your brain is going to interpret the eloquence as truth, but that's really not the case. So if you take, for example, if I if, if there's some kind of business advice, okay, if there's a business business advice on how to hire an employee and there's a very eloquent sentence on it's you should hire say hard-working people even though they're not smart and you would want to make sure that your business advice comes from someone who is who actually knows what they're talking about so it's very important to consider the source of the information you just don't want to consume any information nowadays because it could be written by like complete idiots or like by a machine as i showed you you want your information source to be legit because otherwise you might just be executing the wrong knowledge. I'm still mind blown that a machine wrote these. Yeah, I think the way the technology works is that they read like billions of documents and they discover patterns. So the machine kind of, it's called... Uh, linguistic analysis or something there's a guy on twitter who does this wait let me let me check what exactly it's called so there's a thread by this guy called bowtide swan who seems like a very intelligent guy and this is called um wait <laughs> let me find that thread Yeah, this is called NLP, and what that means is new natural language processing. So these technologies, what they do is they read like billions of documents, and then they process it and try to understand what the document is actually saying. So how did you take a word, a sentence, a paragraph, and digitize its meaning so that we can work with the text at scale? So he has an entire thread that was pretty interesting to me. So what they do is they consider, they kind of try to construct a structure where there's a word and they try to find out what words have the most context to that word. So good, what comes after good? Is it morning? Is it good day? Is it say good potatoes and things like that? What never comes after good? So good, the good, bad. And it's basically trying to process context and try to understand what the texts are saying. And they do this with machine learning across billions of documents. And that's how they're able to come up with such realistic and, you know, such eloquent sentences. But you can already tell that there's no guarantee that this advice is going to be good or not, even though it sounds really nice and deep. So it's very important to consider the source of your advice. You don't want to take startup advice from someone who has never done a startup before, correct? You don't want, you definitely don't want to take startup advice from GPT-3. <laughs> and you mentioned that there are accounts that are using GPT-3 right now. Mm. Are they anonymous accounts or faced accounts as well? Both. I'm not going to burn anyone here, but there's both. And I think that's one of the good things uh, with you, Harsh, in terms of doing the interviews, where it gives you a brand new look to your audience, where they see you or they hear you speaking and they're thinking, wait, this guy is speaking this long regarding topics. No, he's definitely not GPT-3, even <laughs> though I, I doubt they ever thought that. But so people was that fake? Uh, go ahead. Sorry, I keep interrupting you. I'm so sorry. No, no problem. Was that something that you had in mind where you're thinking, because I don't know about you, Harsh, but nowadays I do see a lot of not just anonymous accounts, but faced accounts as well, where they all seem like they're saying similar stuff. And 
the more that they say similar stuff, the more engagement it gets and the more that it starts popping off. And I'm thinking, huh, some of it sometimes doesn't seem real. It doesn't seem like there's any soul where there's a great account. And I believe both of us follow him. Uh, Fateh Singh, Fateh Shurnu. Mm -hmm. Like, I love his account. And I'm thinking anytime I read his tweets, like, man, this guy has some fire. I know that he's a person, right? And I know Where's when I'm okay. reading you that you're a person, that you, you have fire. But was that ever an, an intention for you, Harsh, where you're thinking, let me differentiate myself from no, these wasn't. masses even it more? It's just something that happened on its own. And how do you like doing interviews? I'll tell you what, okay, with interviews, when people are faking things and they don't actually know them, like when they're just saying things and, you know, re reading a book and then, you know, acting like they're an expert, they can't do interviews. They literally cannot because they'll get stuck every sentence because they have to think. So if you, and I, I'll give this exercise to a reader, okay, like if you're listening to this, Try doing a 10-minute speech impromptu on a topic that you don't know much about or don't have experience in. And you will find that you'll get stuck like every second sentence. For example, if you've never started a business, try doing a podcast or, you know, try try speaking 10 minutes on how to start a business with like without doing like extra research, like just start away. And you'll find that you'll keep getting stuck and stuck and stuck. You just can't speak fluently about things you don't know. So I think it's, extremely like to be able to converse like this requires actual experience and knowledge like you you wouldn't be able to talk about public speaking and you know social skills if you didn't have any experience with them like you would have to like research every line and then practice and then say it but you can't do that here can you no and the, the more hyper targeted that you can get which by uh, just by having a long form Harsh, we are going to get hyper-targeted regarding certain topics. I don't think a person without skin in the game can get hyper-targeted in topics. Where earlier, I believe we were talking about self-education, and you went all the way into talking about the kind of courses that you take. And that's not something that a person can do if they don't have skin in the game. Agree. I think that these podcasts really go to, you know, Essentially, like if you take anyone on online or wherever, if you can hear them speak fluently, you can kind of know that they know what they're talking about. And it's not always the case, of course. There are exceptions. There are people who can speak very fluently without saying anything, like politicians or people who recommend stocks on TV. But in most cases, if you're getting like specific information that's actionable and, you know, it isn't like a guy said things for a minute without saying anything like a politician, then you can always know that the person is legit. Well, before we started this podcast, Arsh, you said that you were getting some messages from a few of your followers asking, yo, when's Unapologetic Truths episode nine coming out? That basically implies that they're gaining value out of these episodes, where if you're hearing an average politician talk for a long time, you're not necessarily learning something new that is equipping you with practical knowledge for your life. With some politicians, they may be able to teach you something, but they, I'm speaking. talking about the right, and I'm talking about the generic uh, politician. Where with us, we're capable of teaching, and this is a different kind of knowledge. Where it's not something that you just get from books; it comes from experience and living what you're talking about. I agree. I think that experience is the most important thing, especially for anyone who wants to, you know, teach anything to anyone else. So you could, you, well, there are people who just lack experience and they'll try to, you know, teach and they're going to essentially do a disservice to the people who follow them. Do you personally like getting interviewed more or having these conversation style talks? I can do either ways. They don't really have a preference. What happens in interviews is that, you know, I don't get to learn that much because, you know, I'm just answering questions. With you, I get to learn quite a bit. What about you? For me, Arsh, I personally like the conversation once more. 
but I can see the need for interviews. Where normally, if someone is asking me to come on their show, they're normally trying to get me for an interview. I haven't had too many people say, "Hey, come through and let's have a conversation," and that's not how they personally host their show. So when you and I decided to do this, I thought, "Huh? How about we switch it up and we both have a conversation style?" Because we're roughly around the same age, where we have similar interests. We're both into self improvement, and I believe that we can both learn from each other. So I see a need for both. Harsh,、uh, this is more so play for us rather than something. Okay, let me prepare. Let me get some notes, which I normally don't do for interviews either. <laughs> so it, it's all play, and I see the need for both. And there's、mm. another another style where it's a group style, where my brother, my old roommate, and I, we were just thinking about starting a small sports podcast, and we weren't going to make it public or anything. It's just an opportunity for us to stay in touch because my brother lives in Pennsylvania, I live in Florida, and my old roommate lives pretty far away. So it was going to be for a social activity, and that's a different dynamic as well. Because all three of us have to time each other out. Where when one person wants to speak, the other two want to speak as well. So it's all a different dynamic. I see the need for all types of content out there, and I believe it suits your personality type.、Mm-hmm. I am, I am interested though, Harsh. How have you enjoyed this experience? Where you have been investing a lot. Into your speaking as well, where you hired a voice coach, and I know you. I'm pretty sure you listen back to your tapes.、I、How's、do. that process been? It's been very enlightening, and I know that for a fact because now when I communicate, people are able to hear me much better, especially internationally. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you what. So earlier, no, so I run an affiliate marketing business, and I have LMM. And both of these businesses involve me communicating with people who are abroad, especially Americans and Europeans. And before, you know, I would have to repeat myself every once in a while just because they didn't understand something that I said. So, for example, if I say the word "old," you can say that I'm saying "old," but earlier I would say "old" because you know that's how Hindi is. And For them, it just wouldn't register. Like they would have to like listen to that word two or three times to say that I, to understand that I meant old, old. Do you get me? Yes. Or different you, style. Yeah, it's a different. So when when the L, so there's a lot of Hindi. You know, is a very is a language that has very very strong consonants. So it has all the R's are rolled. So R R R instead of R, and. All the L's are strong L's, so L L L instead of L, or L L, and the TH sound the is T sound, so the and the. There's a difference there, there. So all of these things add up, and people internationally, it just sounds weird to them, you know, just like how a white person speaking Hindi. Just sounds weird to us. Like I was listening to、uh, a few clips of white people trying to speak Hindi, and I just couldn't really understand them. I just can't. I couldn't tell what they were saying. Especially, I, like I could tell somewhat. Like I, I could tell, like say eighty percent, but twenty percent, I would I either have to focus really hard, or I just even I, even after focusing, I just could not understand. So unless there were subtitles, I would just be lost, and they would only speak my language.、Mm-hmm. So. I just understood immediately that you know I'm doing the same thing, right? I'm speaking English, but I'm speaking English in an Indian accent. So that's why they're not able to understand me. That's why they have to ask me to repeat myself. That's why they have to tell ask me what did you just say. The problem is not them. It the problem was me because I was not speaking the language correctly. So I decided to hire a coach to help me correct my accent. So it has its pros and cons because. The Indian accent is completely normal in India, so Indians think my accent, what I'm doing, is trying to be fake and you know, trying to act like I'm American when I'm not. But it's just helping me communicate better, especially for my businesses which are abroad, 
and moreover it's just helping me connect better with my global audience and if you take basic game theory you know indians can understand the american accent properly but everyone outside of india can't understand the indian accent much like they find it funny and a lot of words are just missed and they can't tell what's being said unless they pay a lot of attention so for me it just makes sense to just learn how to speak english correctly so i hired a coach to help me with that and i think that there's a lot of difference there and doing the podcasting has brought way more awareness to your communication well it kind of was the reason i learned that my voice wasn't as good as i hoped it was in the sense that you know like if you if you're doing something wrong but you never really watch yourself do it then you can't tell that you're doing something wrong and making podcasts and you know be essentially becoming someone who's presenting something that you you're recording yourself and then hearing yourself speak it brings you a lot of self awareness isn't it tough listening to your voice back on tape for the first time yeah it's it's a little cringy <laughs> like it's it's very cringy because you know for you you're already familiar with familiar with all the content and you're paying attention solely to how you speak and then every mistake or everything that's not clear sticks out and you know yeah it's it's very cringy and i've spoken to other creators as well especially people who do youtube and they tell me they have the same experience So harsh what I'm about to say is similar to what we're talking about but it's going to seem like it's transitioning away but stick with me and we're going to come back to exactly what we're speaking about. Mm-hmm. So I wrote a newsletter recently called Buzzing and if you're listening to this and you're not on the Armani Talks newsletter sign up. I'm going to drop the link in the description box. I drop daily content on public speaking, social skills and emotional resilience along with other topics. Anyways, that was a quick little plug. But in this And click uh, the like uh, button too, you know, while you're at it. Yeah, there we go. Uh, this newsletter was called Buzzing. And uh, the essence of this newsletter was where nowadays I have this routine in the morning where I watch back an old YouTube video that I recorded, listen to an old podcast and read an old blog. And I consider it old if it's 8 months or older. and as i'm consuming the content back i notice that there's this strong buzzing sensation in the front of my brain and i'm thinking whoa this is a strong buzzing sensation it's like the brain is being warped in some ways as me i'm watching myself speaking and since it's a video from 8 months ago it's as though my brain sort of recognizes this person but i look different You know mm. what I'm saying? Yes. Where since I'm with myself all the time, I don't necessarily know firsthand how different I look in 8 months. But when you see it on tape, you're like, "Whoa, did my hair really look like that in that video?" So, I'm feeling this buzzing sensation. I'm listening back to the audio, and once again, I'm feeling this buzzing sensation. So, I start googling it. I'm thinking, "Man, what what is this sensation? It's where technology is making me physiologically feel different and that's when i researched a concept known as psycho neuromuscular theory which i'm not going to bore you with but athletes who watch back their game film notice the same thing as well when they're watching back let's say their cricket match their basketball game their football game they physically feel different and this is when your nervous system is being altered so back to what we were saying listening back to yourself is so hard because it's not just a mental thing physically there's that cringe because it's challenging your brain's sense of self normally we're consuming our tape or our tape of our lives through first person perspective but when you are listening back to your podcast harsh or when i'm watching my youtube video back we're pretty much objectifying ourselves then consuming it back and now we're sort of like an audience member. So I did want to talk about that because I thought that was unique where you physically feel different. Hmm, for sure. I think that's completely true and I've had the same experience. 
and you know not just physically different sometimes it just is a bit shocking isn't it it is i was listening to an old youtube podcast i did and the way i spoke was completely different even the phrases i used to use back then were different so yeah it is it kind of like shows you your growth like it's like taking progress pictures in a way it is and when you watch it back harsh where if you listen back to unapologetic truths episode 1 me and you we sound different in a good way where at that stage we were where we had to be but nowadays we're different in many ways we'll be better over time i think that since we're both into self improvement as time goes on we will keep getting better and better and better and i think that's Absol- a good thing absolutely isn't it crazy it's been a year since unapologetic truths episode 1 it's been a year yeah let me just double check time moves fast i know it was in november it was a few days before my birthday oh, yeah happy it was birthday. A- when's your birthday oh, should i be asking let's do an answer let's not let's not dox you no no it doesn't matter it's november 27th and today's november 15th. so my birthday is november yeah my birthday is november 27th today is november 14th for me 15th for you and we recorded our first ever episode drum roll please <laughs> november 6th <laughs> whoa it's november 6th damn that's crazy isn't it time moves fast Dude, that episode was epic because I had a feeling that me and you were going to do an episode, but I didn't know it was going to be released at the end of the year, and it just came out perfect because the the flow of it went smooth, and I felt as though we had great chemistry from we that had episode. Good chemistry, correct. Which brings me up to last episode, dude. Last episode was my favorite episode. and that just had to be the episode where we had technical issues <laughs> so after that talk harsh i immediately listened back to the tape i'm like damn man the technical issues but for me personally i don't mind uploading imperfection but at that point i'm thinking okay i'm not doing this by myself i also have harsh in the mix as well let me run it by him but a part of me was thinking and harsh is probably going to need some time to think about it. So when I told you, I'm expecting you to get back to me in like a day or two. But you remember what you said? Just publish it. You're like just publish it. <laughs> I'm like, man, this guy knows how to make decisions quick. So I did want to talk about that harsh. What's your viewpoints on decision making? Do you have a certain framework or how do how do you process that? See if it's it's simple really so if the stakes are low okay if the cost of failure is nothing or very low then just do it like don't think too much about it so for example if you want to ask a girl out what's the worst that can happen nothing so just ask her out publish a podcast even though you didn't sound as good as you wanted to what's the worst that can happen a bunch of people will leave you negative comments so what just publish it like in, there's no there's no consequence of failure here correct but when the cost of failure is high let's say that you're doing a leverage trade then you have to be very serious and be sure like if you want to get married then you have to be very very serious and make sure that the decision is correct so it's really about what's at stake and if the stakes are low then you should you know take the risk without even thinking much but if the stakes are very high then you should have a more conservative and more well thought out approach got it so if you take and there's one thing i learned about content creation over the years is their abp okay always be publishing and that means that even though something is not perfect just publish it it's fine like it's about creating the momentum and you know having content coming out and out did you uh, create that a mantra by yourself or did no, you write somewhere No I did I heard it somewhere Can I can see that one more time ABP always be publishing I think it's from this movie called Glen Gary Glen Ross if you've heard of it Mm I haven't heard of that So 
th- that movie has this entire speech about ABC that is always be closing. And, you know, coffee is for winners only. And ABP is always be publishing. Oh, yeah. I think that's a movie with Alec Baldwin. I'm not fully sure who that is, but this, this is he makes this very big speech and just vanishes. Yes, it, I'm 98% sure that's the movie with Alec Baldwin. Who Have you heard about what went with him recently? I don't know the name, so not really. Okay, well, j- just to bring it up, because this is something that was trending recently. So Alec Baldwin, from what I heard, was on set recording a movie, and they gave him a prop gun, right? Where different actors have props to shoot the scene. Mm -hmm. And apparently this gun was loaded and he shot it and it ended up killing the cinematographer. Isn't that insane? Wait, how can a prop gun shoot? Was it a real gun? It was a real gun. And apparently they're trying to figure out how a mishap like this happened. How did a real gun get to the scene? And the person that was in charge of the cameras ended up dying. So... Uh, this is pretty intense. Yeah, that and sucks for the camera guy. It's not his fault, but he died. So what happened to a, this guy? It's now? a woman. Oh, it's a woman? And that sucks for her then. Yeah, it's the woman that uh, passed away. And now with Alec Baldwin, I believe he issued some statements recently. But it's not his fault from what I'm hearing. Uh, because I don't think he was aware that the gun was loaded. I have but to now, ask, the, what comes of it? Does he go to jail? Like, How is this treated? Is it murder or what? I'm pretty sure he'll get charged for manslaughter, not murder. Or I think manslaughter is due to it being unintentional. But now people are pulling up a whole bunch of his old tweets because he had a lot of these tweets where it was talking about it'll be a shame if someone accidentally died, where it does not relate to this uh, horrific incident. But there are a lot of damning tweets he posted in the past. And, you know, Twitter, people will pull up these past tweets and be like, aha, look, this must relate with this. No, no, I don't think that's relevant because, you know, you just see a lot of things on Twitter, but you don't really, they aren't like your plans. You're just saying them as a joke or whatever. And if you go on YouTube and just type in Alec Baldwin paparazzi, you'll see so many encounters he has with the paparazzi. And... The media does not like him too much. So they are having a field day with him. And yeah, uh, Alec Baldwin is a pretty big celebrity in Hollywood. So this has been going on recently. So how many years of prison is manslaughter? Manslaughter. Sometimes you don't even go to prison because it's something like hitting, hitting a person with a car where you didn't intend to, let's say the person was running across the street, I believe that's either manslaughter or homicide. And you may not even go to prison for that. I believe you'll have a, you'll probably have to volunteer or do some sort of service, but I have heard that people get off. Hmm. So it's like a, a tragedy for the woman's family because, you know, not only does this person die, but there are no consequences for it either. I think that at least, this guy should, you know, give money or whatever, like, you know, some a good amount of cash to the woman's family. Right. And don't quote me on the manslaughter or the homicide part, because I just typed in manslaughter, how many years in Google, and it just in bold letters writes 15. I haven't read the article, so do not quote me on that. 15 is overkill or something like this, because it wasn't intentional for sure. Like, I don't know for sure, but like... Probably it wasn't intentional. So 15 is too much for something that wasn't intentional. But I think someone rich like him, I would say a fair penalty would be like three years in prison. Plus, say, a good amount of money. Three years in prison just to, you know, to make the point that this is not okay. and There are penalties for killing someone. But since it was unintentional... You don't want to rob him of 15 years because that's too much. So I would say a fair penalty would be three years in prison and a fair sum of money. I don't know how much money he has, so a fair sum of money to the victim's family. That's that's a sentence I would give if I was a judge. And 
uh, this is assuming that i think the person is innocent like i didn't uh, he, he didn't intentionally kill the person yeah i would be more concerned of who the prop manager was because isn't there a group of people that are in charge of setting the props for the movie i'm more curious about that person rather than alec baldwin because if he had no clue that the gun was loaded i don't know if he should serve prison time he should he should because what you if, know, that's his responsibility to check anyway it's i'm highly curious about what's about to happen have you heard the news on twitter i have I I saw this come across on Twitter a few times on Twitter a few times where some guy accidentally killed someone else so I think that was it I think this has happened before in movies though um have you seen the lord of the rings the first movie yes so in the first part of the movie you know like in the in the first movie there's this guy who dies no and the end he gets shot by the arrow and there are knives being thrown at him I know what you're talking about. Uh the same guy from Game of Thrones who dies in I the forgot. first season. I think the guy dies all the time. I know who you're talking about with the guy with the beard, long hair. Yeah, I I remember I know his name. I remember I watched a YouTube compilation of him dying. It's seen been or something. Mhm. Okay, so this guy when he's dying like his scene is that there's a guy who's throwing knives at this guy. So apparently one of the knives that were thrown at him was real. So all really? the other knives go cluck 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 but this this knife you can literally hear the metal clang. So one knife was actually a real knife that was thrown at him and luckily he was able to block that with his prop. This uh, is this captured on YouTube? Yeah, it's on YouTube. I think yeah, just Google um seen been real life through or something wait let me let me find this so yeah this is like in his fight with aragon the actor who played lords in the lord of the rings the fellowship of the rings accidentally flung a real dagger at Viggo Mortensen who was able to block the dagger with his sword. Okay, and you're talking about Sh- Sean Bean. There's another like in the scene with Boromir, the actor who plays Lord accidentally shot Sean Bean with real arrows. And but Bean was able to finish the scene and simply pull them out later. It was good that he was unharmed. <laughs> real <laughs> arrows that's insane that's insane have I've you heard ever about shot this... an arrow never have you i've shot a gun before i've shot like a shitty arrow before like it wasn't like a good arrow but I, when i had gone to a jury spot there was a guy who was letting you shoot this you know arrow but not a very good arrow for like 10 rupees a shot so i took a couple of shots i shot a slingshot before Have you ever heard of those? Oh, this is where you have a stick, like a Y-shaped stick and a rubber band. Yes, that one. Who did you shoot it at? So when I was living in Bangladesh, I would make it and from far away, I shoot at my teachers. <laughs> yeah. So, so when I was when I was living in Bangladesh, harsh, the teachers were allowed to hit you and mm-hmm. they'd hit you with a ruler. So I was a bad kid. I was getting hit non-stop and <laughs> my teacher did my teacher would get slick with me. One time uh, she would make me fish uh face the corner of the walls. And have you ever heard of upon bush? This basically means uh basically go up and down, up and down, up and down We're holding your that. ears. I know, I know. It's like squats, but like yeah, yeah, we have that thing too. Yeah, so she's making me do this for 20 minutes and I'm getting tired and she's like, "Are you going to be a bad kid anymore?" I was like, "No, no, I'm not going to be a bad kid." And then it just so happens 10 minutes later I do something bad. So what she starts doing is she gets her ruler and on the side of it it's it's metal. 
So she starts rubbing it on her shoe. She heats it up and then she puts it on my hand and I'm in pain. It starts burning me. And I'm like, man, I'm going to get this bitch back. So that's when I go uh, to my crib. I make a slingshot. And from far away, I start throwing or shooting these little rocks at her. And your boy had some okay aim. I was two out of 10. But those <laughs> tiny little pebbles hit her. I felt so good. <laughs> so didn't your class snitch on you though? No. So what happened was when I was living in Bangladesh, we lived in a way where the school was close to where I lived. Right? Okay. So as soon as the teachers were leaving, I was on the second area, the second floor area, and I was pretty much hiding behind a chair. And then I was targeting it towards her as she was coming out of the class. So my classmates weren't near me. Hmm. Because, you know, in those ages, people snitch on you a lot. Like you can't trust anyone. Oh, yeah, dude. Especially if they get caught in trouble, they'll try to blame it on someone else. Like, how how come I'm only getting in trouble? Arman was the one who made me do it. <laughs> I'm like, you idiot. <laughs> I know yeah, who I know who else I'm good. shooting my slingshot at. <laughs> that sounds fun though. How was Bangladesh like? I loved Bangladesh. Mainly because during that era, I didn't have much else to compare it with. Where I had close friends. We all had similar interests. We didn't know much about PlayStations, Game Boys, or anything like that. I was playing outside a lot. I was playing Lukachori, which means hide and seek. Hide and seek. Uh, Ludo, outdoors. Ludo, yeah. Okay. Right. Um, slingshots. And that was about it. And we'd play a lot. It was close knit where most people knew each other. And I would switch uh, between Taka and Chittagong, which are the two popular parts in Bangladesh. So I got to see uh, Dhaka was more city like, while Chittagong was more village like. So I got to see two different sides of Bangladesh and I enjoyed it, man. I was sad when I found out I was coming to Florida and I had to say bye to a lot of people, but it was a transition that was worth making. But I still remember that childhood memory. Mm. So do you visit Bangladesh often or haven't you, have, have you gone there recently? I haven't been there recently. The last time was 2010. Whoa. And now, right. And nowadays, Harsh, if you're American and you're going there, it's not the safest. Where normally when we land, I'm a pretty tall guy. I'm six foot to six foot one. So I'm towering over a lot of these people. And they look at me and they could already tell that I'm from America. And I had some relatives and people that we know. They got kidnapped in Bangladesh. What? Where, yeah, and um, it's in different sides. So it's just, you want to be safe. If you're going, you want to make sure you're going with the right people. And if I speak Bangla, immediately people can tell that I'm from America. And yeah, I haven't had the chance to visit too much, but I do want to visit more in the near future. I don't know, man. From what I can tell, Bangladesh seems like a war-torn country. Like, I've seen reports of them destroying temples and, you know, killing Hindus. And it doesn't seem like the best place in the world. Like, it seems like second Afghanistan. So I haven't been there in so long, so I don't know what the state of it is now. I, I do have relatives that live there, but they live in the upper parts as well. I believe some of my relatives live next to the the clothing factory, where if you look at your shirts now, a lot of it is made in Bangladesh. I believe a, a ton of our family lives around that area. Um, but yeah, man, I haven't been there in so long, so I can't give too much of an opinion. Is India like that? No, India is relatively very safe. I don't think this type of stuff happens in India where you know a bunch of people will go and break down the temple and kill the locals and things like that. That doesn't happen here. India is very safe and very developed, like not all of it, but f- our culture and our people are generally very peaceful. And are there you can you can visit there... India safely without any issue. Like if you're an American, even if you're a single girl, 
and I know with the internet, you know, if you go and Google this, India is safe for women, they'll tell you it's not, but that's really bullshit, okay? India is very, very, very safe. And you will be just fine if you visit India. Even as a lone woman, you'll be just fine. India is very beautiful, very safe. I highly encourage everyone to go and check it out. And if you think it's unsafe, just visit the main cities. And, you know, cities are completely safe. You can be out at 3 a.m. and you'll be just fine. Yeah, if it's the cities, I mean, I have a lot of cousins that live in the cities of Bangladesh where it's nice. I see some of the pictures and I, I'm thinking, man, this looks dope. A lot of my cousins in Bangladesh have Instagram, Snapchat, uh, and it's in the nice parts of Dhaka. So I, I do want people to know whoever's listening to this. Um, <laughs> I, haven't right, no. so I haven't I have been in Bangladesh. I haven't been in Bangladesh in 10 plus years. Mm-hmm. So make sure... Whoever's listening to this, don't take my opinion too seriously in regards to where to visit. Hit up the locals there. Uh, I've been in <laughs> Tampa and Virginia and New Jersey. So just want to give a little bit more context. Hmm. You, so, you said you have a friend. And- yeah. Are you familiar with the concept of virtual assistants? Yes. So I have a, fr- a business associate, you can say. And he had a virtual assistant who was based out of Bangladesh. And the reason he was hiring a Bangladeshi guy was because it's very cheap. And he had to fire this guy because apparently in Bangladesh, they don't have proper electricity. So this guy's electricity would go out a ton of times a day. So he, so my friend will allot him some work. And then 20 minutes later, this guy will just disconnect immediately. So And then he'll say that my electricity was gone. So it was really impossible for my friend to continue working with this guy because... He was just, either he was just taking breaks too often or his electricity was really getting cut that frequently. So I think that I'm not fully convinced about Bangladesh from what I can tell. It seems to be a war torn country. I don't know for sure. I've never been there. Yeah, so the war torn part, I'm not aware of. Uh, the relatives that I speak with there, like, I haven't heard much about that. Um, uh, yeah, so I don't really know much about that. Someone from, there's an Eskon temple in Bangladesh. And I think they recently just a bunch of people from you know, the locals and, you know, even the Eskon temple people are locals, but a bunch of people from Bangladesh, like the other communities, they came and they attacked the temple and they killed the priests for no good reason. So I don't know, man, I wouldn't go to Bangladesh. That doesn't just yes. doesn't feel safe. Yeah, so I'll probably just say no comment on this because... <laughs> Yeah, because I I actually legitimately don't know. And um, and nowadays, dude, one thing that I try to do is, like, if I don't know, I feel very proud saying, yo, I don't know. And um, I made this YouTube video a while back called The Art of Learning How Not to Have an Opinion. And the essence of that video was where every now and then, nowadays at least, people want to have an opinion on every matter, even if they don't know. And it's as though a part of them feels weird or like they lost when they say, I don't know. Or for me personally, I think it's something empowering because it just allows me to say, let me get some more information on this before I form an opinion. Do you Mm. find yourself ever having that where you don't know and you know that people around you don't know, but they still want to formulate an opinion anyways? Oh, for sure. I think I tell people i don't know like at least 10 times a day and you know that's because people on twitter will reach out to me and ask me something like i just don't know so like today in the morning i had a guy who was who reached out to me on telegram and he was asking me what i thought of you know doing up like he was he wanted to be a pilot and he was about to pay for a course and <laughs> i just don't know anything about flying a plane <laughs> so i just told him i just don't know and i don't want to like tell you something at random so yeah, I say that, like, especially, like, I bet the same thing happens to you where people just ask you questions you just have no answer to and you're like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And it kind of makes you feel like, do I know anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, th- there was this one guy who, who was hitting me up. This was a couple of years back. And he starts DMing me and he's like, hey, man, I'm on the verge of quitting my job, but I'm just waiting for what you have to say on the matter. I'm like, bro, <laughs> I, I don't know. 
<laughs> like you're asking us that's what i tell sometimes to these people okay like you're asking a random stranger who doesn't know you about whether you should marry this girl or not like what are you expecting me to say like sometimes people will like send me a picture of a girl and then some traits of her and then say should i marry her and i don't know you at all so how do i give you any advice like i don't know your nature what you want in life and anything like that like if it was like an hour long consultation then for sure i could tell you something useful but without getting to know you there's like or even if i'm familiar with the subject matter without getting to know you it's it's a little superficial yeah you could help them spot red flags where it's one of those advice by negation but i don't know if you could say yes marry this person yeah i can help you say no but i can't help you say yes that's a good way of looking at it so harsh a couple of years back there was this one kid i knew who was asking a few of his friends for advice on his girlfriend and he was talking about how this girl was perfect for him but there was only one catch the catch was that she recently deleted a whole bunch of her text messages and she put a passcode on her phone and then he's like yeah dude but other than that she's perfect arman what do you think and i'm like dude if she's over here deleting text messages and putting a passcode on her phone out of the blue moon you don't need rocket science dude she's probably cheating on you and he's like hmm, no it- man no yes um go ahead you know, like you guys you don't delete your text messages dude this was from her ex oh okay yeah for sure the, then that's a good chance there right and i'm not the kind of guy that wants to get involved in this kind of stuff but he's over here asking me along with a few of the other friends and we're just chilling it's a social event and this is one of those situations where i could help you how to say no but i will not help you how to say yes mm. i i wanted to add on to that point you made earlier mm, makes sense i will say that at least i'm not a very suspicious person so i wouldn't like i wouldn't think too much about someone deleting text messages or you know if that happened i would probably just you know think that okay she wants to move on or something but i sometimes i'm just a little too positive maybe and i know the west is a little more fucked up than india is <laughs> do people cheat over there or do they normally end the relationship first then they move on people here don't date so outside say the main cities people don't date people just have arranged marriages or you know they marry someone like a family friend or something like dating is very uncommon outside certain portions of the big cities in the big cities people do date and many people are very de- degenerate where they they are essentially westerners but because you know in west in the west this is the culture there so there's an entire system but here they're just doing the western thing with no system so they are like being extremely degenerate some people so those people are like uh, you can't just trust them at all but yeah that's there but generally indians don't really date that much we have arranged marriages and our marriages typically last like our divorce rate is not super high i heard harsh and you could correct me if i'm wrong that western culture is going more and more into India. everywhere everywhere western culture is spreading very fast or essentially i would say it's corrupting every other place so if you take india most people are getting very influenced by hollywood and western culture being romanticized in the movies here as well and people like the whole aspect of doing whatever they want and there being no consequences especially women women are like very influenced by these things men are less so but you know i think that cultures across the world are on a decline and it just except china maybe so it's just one of those things you know you can't do anything about it so just live like your best self and hack the system maybe and by then so for example if your friend if he thought he was being cheated on if I, what what advice would you give him let's say that 
this guy might be being cheated on what would you tell him if he's being cheated on dumper keep fucking her but don't like invest any time or energy or emotion into it like just get more pleasure like you know it's like it's an easy way to you know it's a cheap thrill so you know just hack the system okay like yes. when you dump her like you're just going to be like alone and lonely right and you're not going to get anything from it so you can like start seeing other girls and just cheat on her as well right right well, well what i'm saying is don't be exclusive with her if she's yeah, cheating on be, you don't be exclusive don't don't invest in her emotionally in any way yeah and spoiler alert she was cheating on him so if you're listening to this right now and suddenly a woman deletes text messages out of the blue moon red flag, red flag. if she suddenly <laughs> p- puts a, a passcode where you knew the passcode before red flag and it's stunning uh, harsh because you'll see this stuff happening so often to uh, different people and it's as though these patterns um, emerge so yes guys be aware of these kinds of stuff because you don't want to be wasting your time and i'm sure for women they have certain remixes to that when a guy's cheating he'll do x y and z and different girls get together and they'll compare their notes and they'll know certain stuff so yeah women do that you know women are very obsessed you know have you ever read any nature have any read any what a uh, nature nature uh, he's a philosopher frederick frederick yeah, nature frederick nature yeah i haven't but i've been hearing about him more okay so i think i'm not fully sure about this but there's a quote from him or someone else that goes like this okay the reason women aren't friends with each other is because they're all in the same business in the sense that for women historically their entire survival strategy was finding a man and that's why they're like even when they're kids they're so obsessed with you know what did this guy say how did he react does he like me or not and men just don't give a shit like we're like uh, my motorcycle is not working <laughs> So back to back to one of the earlier points if the girl cheats dude I don't think you should even have her as a smash buddy if you have other options if you have no other options I can see the case for it but it's bad energy man I I don't see I don't see the need for it I think you should I think you should go ghost mode I don't know I think that the whole ghost mode thing affects you quite a bit as well because then you're thinking okay what is she? did i get revenge or not and you know you get into that mode it's probably just best to exploit the situation to your advantage because you, you know now the- when someone cheating cheating on you they you owe them no loyalty or friendship or anything like that you can just they fucked you over you can fuck them over now that's a interesting perspective it's a you ever heard of nc north carolina I have heard of that. It's a state in the US? Yeah, it's a state in the US, but it's also slang where I forgot which forum did it, but anytime let's say a guy would get cheated on, they'll be like North Carolina, which pretty much means no contact NC, and that means ghost mode. So your perspective regarding keeping her around and having her as a smash buddy is a different perspective I've heard. where normally my perspective is go ghost mode and find other women no, there should be plenty more my perspective is find other women and just use her for sex mhm have you ever been put in that position no have you ever known people that have been put in that position some of them but not not that many i know like one or two people but not like it wasn't anything that bad right and i would say that the build up to cheating normally is different for men and women where normally when i see the women cheat it's a lot of emotional ties involved for the action to happen while for men it's predominantly a physical activity so that's why i say that in terms of energy i don't know if i want someone like that near me mm yeah i've heard this too okay like there is tweet from i am illimitable man if you know him and the tweet is women cheat because 
they don't love the guy and men cheat because they want variety which is why it's worse when women cheat because they just don't love you anymore who tweeted this illimitable man illimitable man I, i'm not sure if i recall the tweet correctly but i think that was the tweet i could find it right now though if you wait a second let me go to is- twitter <laughs> Yeah, so this is a tweet, okay? It's from March 30. Men cheat because they want sexual novelty and have poor self-control, and women cheat because they don't love you anymore. So, when a man cheats, he's saying that I'm bored of having sex with you. I'll ha- I want to have sex with someone else. And when a woman cheats, she's saying that I found a man who's superior to you in every way conceivable, and I'd rather be with him than you. So, it doesn't even remotely mean the same thing. like it's it's much worse on your psyche when a when a woman cheats on you right it's highly different and in both situations avoid that scenario but i can only speak from the perspective of the guy where for advice if i'm supposed to give advice to someone or they're asking me for it i'd say north carolina man <laughs> i think it depends on the guy you know like someone who is more detached like me I could probably at least I think that I could probably not like I could probably just break away from that attachment and you know just do my own thing and I wouldn't need to not care and I could just do my strategy but someone who's very attached and you know a very emotional person should probably just do North Carolina because then they would never get over the girl Yes and it's different for different people as well where moving on is a process where it doesn't just immediately happen you got to put in some work where some people the first thing they'll ask is well how long is the heartbreak going to be i'm like dude that's the wrong question especially if you're a man your goal is to turn this moment into a great moment where you're leveling up due to the pain you don't just ask when's it going to go away that's a mindset of a victim you want to be a victor and level up all i have to say on this matter is i think i said this on a previous episode as well If you lose your dog, crying about losing your dog is not going to bring him back, but you can just buy a new dog. <laughs> and take from that what you will. <laughs> I think that was the last episode or the episode before that one. I yeah, you laughed then, it made me laugh again. <laughs> but it's true, it's true. Absolutely. And this ties into one of the tweets of yours I have pulled up right now, Harsh. You wrote this one sometime back It's called romanticism is a natural flaw in men ungratefulness is a natural flaw in women. Care to expand? Mm so yeah I think that is a one of my most uh, at least I think that that took me a long time to realize. So men are very romantic and women are very logical when it comes to you know dating and things like that. and people think it's the opposite okay people think men are logical and women are romantic but that's not true and i'll tell you what i mean okay when men date like there might be a rich guy who might date a waitress this type of situation is not that uncommon like r- men are very romantic they just look at the person like this is a good girl i like her she's pretty so i'll start dating her and they don't even like, once they you know get some emotions they they become completely dumb and they just stops stop seeing things logically so they'll ignore like the biggest red flags in the world and men don't really think logically okay most men won't even care how educated the girl is or how smart she is like if they just like her they like her okay women are not that way women are very very logical when it comes to you know things like relationships they won't even let themselves like a guy who doesn't meet their standards so if if a guy makes say less money than them they won't like not only there's a natural repulsion but they won't even let themselves entertain the thought of being with this guy because he makes less money than them or if they think a guy won't be successful they won't they won't even entertain him so women are very hypergamous they're very logical they want like the best option so essentially women treat relationships like a business and it ties into what nature thought 
where women are into one business only. They only have one thing to provide. So they want the best thing they can get for it. Well, a remix to that quote I harsh, uh, heard harsh is, men look for a reason to qualify. Women look for a reason to disqualify. Um, so, yeah, that's because, you know, women are the ones who get to choose. Okay, Women pick who gets to have sex with them because, you know, they're the gatekeeper to sex. And men take what they can get. Yeah, and if you break it down, uh, the traditional woman is being approached by a lot of men. So if you're being approached by a lot of men, now you're looking for a stronger filtration process. While a lot of men, even if you're good looking, even if you dress up, you're not always being swarmed by tons and tons of women, you're still going to have to put in some work. And let's say you're 10 notches below that, where you're a bum, you don't have a nice fashion sense, you getting attention from a woman is going to be a rarity. And in your perspective, you're going to be looking for any reason as to why you should invite this person into your life. And let's say she does show some red flags, you're going to be like, no, nah, no, nah, that's not even that big of a deal. It's just a one-time kind of thing. And you're looking for reasons to qualify. So it's the dynamic that's different. Right, Harsh? Because men and women are being approached differently. Yes, but the thing that's worth studying is why does the dynamic differ? And that's because, reproductively speaking, women are the ones who make babies. So it's it's basically guaranteed that a woman will pass on her genes. But it's not guaranteed a man will. So the best strategy for a woman, since she is the one, she, you can think, let's say nature's thought again. Okay? Women only provide one thing, that's sex and pleasure. Sex, pleasure, and children, okay? And they're in one business. They're all competing with each other. And their business is trying to get the best man. They are in the same thing. So that's why they're obsessed with men from the beginning. Like even when they're children, they're trying to, they're trying to think like, why did he say this to me? What did I mean? And they, they care about the whole interpersonal thing. But men don't give a shit. Like men want to play with toy trucks and things like that. So for men, the reproductive strategy was to try to fuck as many women as possible to pass on their genes. Mm -hmm. So men are not into like, we don't give a shit what tone something was said in because it it just doesn't doesn't matter to us. So for us, the game was always about being competent and, you know, being rich and having more power because that is something that allows a man to have many women. So it's the game, the dynamic between men and women are different. And that's why, in modern society, we have men approaching women because, you know, women are the gatekeepers to children and we all want to reproduce. A woman doesn't Absolutely. have to approach people because she is the prize, right? In in this situation, if she is the one who decides who gets to have the ch- kid because she is the one making the kid, then she gets to, you know, make the choice who gets to fuck her. Absolutely. So that, it's a, then go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Harsh. Oh yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's a different dynamic for both the sexes, and just one of those realities of life, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad that you and I spent some of these episodes breaking down the different dynamics, because just to say that everything is the same is not it, logical it's and incorrect. it's highly irresponsible as well. But people want to believe that, you know, a lot of people are like, they've had this whole equality feminism thing put in their head and they get really mad when anyone suggests that might not be true. There was this one moment, Harsh, this was a few years back. By the way, I forgot, what were we actually discussing? Like, this was supposed to conclude to something, I I just don't remember. I I don't remember either, bro. (laughs) (laughs) I, I remember there's a reason we got into why women and women are different like just before that. I believe it was initially it started off because we were talking about the different reasons men and women cheat. Yeah, the different, but there was something in the middle. I think when we listen to the recording, we'll find out. Okay. Well, I'll make a note of that to bring it up next episode. If we do not recall it this episode, oh yeah, I remember. I remember you were asking me why uh, you were asking me to elaborate on a tweet on 
men being romantics and women being ungrateful and these being flaws in people okay so yeah yes okay. so you know and you will often find you know you will never hear a man say that i think sally looks good but she doesn't have the income potential i'm looking for but women will say that all the time like women are like businessmen when it comes to dating and relationship but men are like very romantic and dumb in these matters and the reason i said ungratefulness is a natural flaw in women this is actually something that was said to me by a muslim friend of mine so he was reading a book called the quran and he was telling me this uh, quote from the quran that says something like there's a guy called muhammad i'm not really sure what that guy does or is i think mm-hmm. he's the god in islam so this a messenger okay so this messenger guy and i'm not sure what exactly how, how islam works but so bear with me i, I might have misunderstood yeah but, no worries go ahead okay so this uh, muhammad uh, person um, he's he's quoting something like he went to hell and then he came back and in hell he saw that hell was full of women for their ungratefulness and i'm not trying to be disrespectful okay like if i just get something wrong i just i just not very familiar with the islamic religion so this person he goes to hell and he comes back so i i, I assumed he was a god because how can you go to hell and come back so this per- this person so essentially that was like a light bulb moment for me like yeah like women are and un- women are often ungrateful like they they don't really process the sacrifices men make for them and they kind of think that this is to be expected they they are they feel entitled to it mhm does that make sense like for example if you take monogamy for women monogamy is normal but like we just talked about earlier for men it's not for men being monogamous is a sacrifice but women will never appreciate that because they just don't get it like this is like an inherent flaw in women like they're just ungrateful about it like if a man like as a guy you could like sleep with dozens of women right you don't have to get married to one but getting married to one is a sacrifice you're making because you love her so women don't appreciate that like they think that because they are monogamous that means men must be monogamous too so why is it a big deal for men to you know be monogamous it's, it for from their perspective they just lack that great gratefulness but from ours like from a man's perspective it's a big sacrifice but women will never appreciate that so i think that's a big portion of the whole ungratefulness thing and even in other things like women kind of expect a guy to provide for her like women will expect you to make money and if you don't make money they will like start disrespecting you and you know essentially think you're a loser even though she isn't making any any money either like if the roles were reversed like she was making the money and you're doing the housework she will dis- disrespect you anyway because you're not making any money so women are women have a lot of entitlement like they they just want certain things and they expect to get it from men and if they're not provided with those things they think men are losers it's, even though if you think logically if you are expecting something be provided to you that makes you a loser because you can't get it yourself <laughs> so that's from that's the source of that read that's where it came from so it came from a hadith i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing that correctly from yes the islam you are pronouncing that correct i think how many books are there in islam one is quran oh quran okay well i'm glad you i asked you to expand on that tweet because I never heard you break it down the romanticism part the way you did as a flaw in men and the ungratefulness part as the way you did in women even though we did talk about intersexual dynamics a few times in our past episodes I believe the context and the route that you took it in this episode was much different because I haven't heard the point regarding the monogamy part that you made uh, this was your first time bringing it up if i'm not mistaken yeah this is the first time aren't you glad that i am stuck in your tweets right now <laughs> <laughs> these podcasts are a lot of fun are man so i would like to yeah. hear your take on that tweet well harsh since you are I mean, muslim correct so i would like to hear your take on that hadith well i in regards to the tweet i think it's one of the more interesting things i've heard 
because I do think that some men need to be more realistic in terms of understanding that the partner that you choose is going to have a huge impact on your life. It's not just all uh, fun and giggles. It's going to be a person that should uh, fuel your ambition, especially if you're an ambitious person. They should serve as an amplifier. So you can't just be completely r- uh, romantic the entire time uh, using Disney Channel movies as your uh, North Star. Like, this is how it works in the movies. This is how it must work for me. So that part of the tweet, I got it. In regards to the ungratefulness, I found that to be unique because I never thought about that lens from women. And this is a story that I was going to tell you a while back, and I believe we digressed. So this was a couple of years back. I was dating this one chick, and like throughout our relationship, she was becoming I want to say she was becoming feminist. I believe she was. And I was young at that time. I think I was like, I, I don't think I was even 21. And there's this place in Gainesville. You ever heard of Gainesville? No, I have not. Okay, it's in Florida. It's this place where you could get floats. And it's this huge river where a bunch of tourists go there. They get their floats. And it's like a they lazy river. What? Floats. And a float is something that helps you you could just Google it real quick, like water floats. Um, you get to sit on it, and it helps you float above the water and just chill on it. Oh, is that right? round thing? Like yes. The round tube. Okay, yeah, I know that. Yes. Yeah, so me and this girl were going on this nice little relaxing ride. It's not even a ride. It's on a lake. As we're going, what's starting to happen is that it's getting windier and windier. And I noticed that there's a certain segment of people that are being swayed to the right side. And if you go on the right side, then you're going to be off track and you're not going to be where you're supposed to be. I don't want to go in more detail than that. So as we're swinging to the right side, I noticed that there's no people around there and it's difficult to get back to where we're supposed to be. And at this point, this girl was telling me, Oh, we're equal in everything. There's nothing that you could do that I can't do. And at this point, I'm like, all right, time to put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> Go on and help me pull this. Uh, basically, I have to get out of the float and I have to pull the floats against the tide back to where we're supposed to go in wind. And at this point, she is freaking out. Obviously, she can't do it and I'm not going to make her do it. So I'm grabbing her in her float I'm grabbing my float and I'm swimming across the tides to get back to where we're supposed to go. And mind you, this place is called Lazy River. I'm thinking that I'm going to be lazy, but <laughs> that's the last <laughs> that's the last thing that I'm doing, dude. And I am using my muscles. It's tough. Swimming across current is one of the toughest things you can do. And this girl is just kind of chilling in the floats, just waiting for uh, the rescuing process to end. And at that point, once we finally hit land, she started to understand that there were so many different things that she learned in that trip. She was like, okay, I get it. Me and you are physically different. And she was grateful in regards to me pulling her back because she knew that she couldn't pull herself back, you know? And she would have been stuck in this narrow place you know, I, I wish I could give you more details in how this thing looks. It's one of those natural springs. So it's Is there not a like, waterfall after? The what? Is there a waterfall or something next to it? Like if you keep going right, you fall off the waterfall. Dude, I wouldn't be surprised because there was a sign, do not enter this side. And this is where we were uh, sewing to. So if there was a waterfall, I wouldn't be surprised. And to tie it back to your point, these sort of stuff, Unless you're put in a predicament where there's danger involved, there's a lot of things you may not be grateful for that you should be grateful for. The mere idea, if I'm walking with a girl like this and a burglar comes, me as the man, without a doubt, I have to do some form of protecting where it's not the same thing for the other person. So I just wanted to give the story to tie into your point. Mm. Um you, you do you see what I'm trying to go with the story? Where it's I like I do, I do, I do, I get you. 
I think yeah, that so. certain people, are, uh, even some women, are capable of appreciating your sacrifices. No, it's not like a universal thing. There are many. Most women can't, but some women can, and most guys can, but some guys can't. So it's like a, it's like but a harsh probability thing. After that moment of that scare where we almost got lost and I had to pull both of our floats back, she became hyper aware regarding small things. Like, let's say I'm picking up a box uh, for uh, something where before she was like, huh, he's been picking up this box the entire time. And this box is rather heavy. But after that danger moment, she became aware of me picking up the box for yeah. future interactions. So I think... You're just a few experiences away from having your perception shifted, uh, men and women. You never know what's going to happen, when that experience is going to be for you. So it's smart to remain open-minded. Have you read the book, Quran? I've been, you know, ever since I heard that hadith from my friend, mm-hmm. I've been meaning to check it out. I just haven't had the time. Like after I get done with the Raman, maybe I'll just have a look. And- yeah, so I, I'm reading the English version right now. Um, growing up, uh, we read the Arabic version. Um, you can read I'll, Arabic. Yes, I could read Arabic, but you know, since I was younger, I didn't understand the material too much, unless I would go for Quran study at the mosque. Um, I will recommend a a Quran translated version uh, after our episode. I just have to pull it up if you need some recommendations. Okay, so what was your biggest takeaway from the book? I believe there's a lot of takeaways, man. I think one of the takeaways is that you have to have you have to guide the mind in some way where if you're just thinking that the mind is going to not have any form of narrative or any form of structure, that's going to be difficult where a mind where it's just supposed to guide itself, it's not going to work. So I believe that, you know, I don't want to, what do you call it, make anyone believe anything in particular, but I do believe that you should always be getting more information to guide your mind. So I believe that's one thing that the book gave me, where there's a lot of different insights and you just have to approach it uh, to see how it can benefit you in a practical way. Hmm. Another thing, Harsh, is the value of repetition. Uh, So Muslims pray five times a day, and that's because you are conditioning yourself to constantly keep repeating something. And the more that you repeat it, the more that your mind starts to absorb the narratives and you start to ingrain it into your life. Uh, For example, with fitness, Harsh, as you've been picking up fitness, did you notice that it's, it's changing your life in some way? Of course. Where you, yeah, you have to sleep a certain time. You have to lift a certain time. Um, so whatever you choose to do, it should help you in your life. And I believe repetition is king for that. Mm, of course, I, I agree with you there. So do what you, exactly? So what exactly is Islam exactly? I've never like seen like a picture of an Islamic god or anything like that. Like I thought Muhammad was the god. So Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and Allah is, so what, is, is... He's like a person, or like, what is it? No, Allah is infinite, is the infinite God, the one source from which all things are created from. And for Islam, there's not multiple uh, gods. And I would say for Hindu as well, there's not multiple gods. There's one God that takes up different forms, right? You guys have Brahman. That's one um, viewpoint. I think that if you like, you have many gods who interact with each other. So I'm not, I'm not fully sure about this. I've heard this thing before. Like, there's many gods, and he has many forms. Like, there's one god who has many forms. But if so, in my reading of the Ramayana, like, there were like multiple gods, like Indra, and they were all interacting with each other. So I'm not fully sure whether it's one god or not. I'm not an expert. Yes. Yeah, so with Islam, it's just one God. That's Allah. It is beyond uh, space, time, and causation. And from there, that's what the uh, Quran is uh, bringing into uh, 
bringing into light. There's different prophets which expand on the message, and Jesus is one of the prophets. So, Wait, isn't Jesus a Jewish God, a Christian God? Yes, that's where I believe Christians and Islam diverge, where Christians view Jesus as a God, where Islam views Jesus as a prophet. You know, for um, the longest time, I thought Christians worship Santa Claus <laughs> uh, until I did a podcast with someone and they told me that's not true. <laughs> recently? Yeah, I think last year. Until last year, I used to think Christians worship Santa Claus. Like, you know, bearded <laughs> guy and, so you know, like gives them gifts. So, you know, maybe they're God. Right. And for me personally, Harsh, I, I will say this. I'm still learning more. You know, I wouldn't say I'm the a person that knows all the answers regarding Islam or Hinduism or Christianity. I'm still in that seeking mode right now where I, I want to know more. And yeah, that's why I've been reading the Quran, the English version recently. For sure. I think that any of these, you know, the bigger religions that have survived thousands of years, their books are worth reading because of the... F- Fact, the very fact that these religions have been around for thousands of years goes to show that there is some information in this book, in these books, that have helped cultures last for a long time. So I would bet there have been thousands of religions, but most religions just die out. But the ones that last are worth studying. So, you know, people usually have this tribalistic thing that I'm only going to read my book and not going to read anything else. And I think that you need to learn multiple things and contrast them to understand humanity and human nature and get the most knowledge. There's a quote from Chanakya that I really love mm-hmm. here. Okay? Chanakya says that even though I know Sanskrit very well, I still want to learn other languages. Just like how gods want to kiss Apsaras even though they have Amrit available. Like it's It's fine to know one thing, but you should always strive to know more. And I don't think the I'm not sure if I translated translated it correctly, but it wasn't like kiss Apsaras, it's like to drink the juice from Apsara's lips, even though they can go and drink Amrit. And Apsaras are like beautiful women in heaven. And that was a little, you know, even I used to be a little, you know, tribalistic about it. Like, why should I read any or learn anything about any other religion when I can just learn the best religion that is Hinduism and that's my religion, Sanatan Dharma. And after that quote from Chanakya, I was like, okay, yeah, maybe he has a point. And I was learning computer science, correct? I'm learning computer science. And I realized that when I learned a language, I learned more about that language when I learned a different language. So when I learned Python, I just learned Python. But when I learned standard ML, which is a functional language, I learned a lot about Python too, like why they were making certain decisions and what are the strengths and weaknesses of Python. So it's like you, you need to have something to contrast it with Absolutely. When I was uh, initially learning C++, I actually started to understand it when I started to learn Python. Mm, yeah, C++ and Python are somewhat different, yes. And one you thing were... recently, Harsh, mm-hmm. that I've been doing, it's a twist from the traditional self-improvement advice. I've been reading more fiction books recently. That's weird. I've and... been doing the same thing. I'm reading a book called Foundation. Like I've only read a bit of it. But it's because a lot of people recommended it to me. But go ahead. No, let me make a note of that real quick because I've been looking for some more fiction books. And the reason that I've been reading it, Harsh, is because it's been teaching me a lot about life. Where one of the books is called Things Fall Apart. Have you ever heard of it? No. So I don't want to ruin the book, but I will just give you a little brief synopsis because we were discussing one of the concepts in regards to it. It's basically about a man named Akwanko. Uh, He lives in Africa, a mighty warrior, and he's slowly rising up the ranks. But throughout the book, what's happening, I believe, is the European forces or the British forces, whatever, is coming into his village and it's destroying his culture. And slowly, people from his culture are shifting into a new worldview and things are slowly falling apart. And I've read this book multiple times throughout my life. And even though it's a novel, it's had practical benefits in my life where I'm always cognizant not to get a content. Always understand that things can change around you. What's working now 
may not work in another year or two, mm. let alone a few months. And don't be like a Congo where he's trying to hold on to things being the same. Embrace change or at least learn to adapt in it. And this fiction book has had so much practical value in my life where I think nowadays in the self-improvement space, I've been creating more tweets about, yo, read more fiction. It could help you. And not only that, Harsh, I've noticed that conversations become easier. You think differently when you can turn words and you, you could use it to empathize with characters who aren't even real. It allows you to think in a different way. So I'm fascinated that you're reading fiction now as well. Yeah, I think there was a movie that came out recently called Dune and a lot of people, essentially, even a lot of like very successful people asked me to read it. So I thought, I avoid the book and it's like a 500 page book. It's huge. And I thought, I thought to myself, I'm not reading 500 pages of fiction initially. So, you know, not going to do that. It's like three books and I think all of the books are like very long. So I don't want to invest that much time in a fictional book. So I told them like, do you have a better book that's shorter? So that's where people recommended me Foundation. Mm-hmm. Foundation. Okay, I'm going to check it out. Have you been liking it so far? I've read a small amount of it. I got it yesterday from Amazon. It seems to be nice. It comes very highly recommended, so I'm sure it's very good. Mm-hmm. A few other good books are Outsiders, Tears of a Tiger, and I would say any Dan Brown book. Dan Brown, I think I've read one of his books many years ago. Um, I don't, it used the Vinci to be, Code? It's about antimatter. I don't remember the name of the book. So and, there, there's these ambigrams and the Illuminati and antimatter and the city about to blow up because of antimatter. Angels and Demons? Angels and Demons, yes. There we go. Okay. That book was awesome. Yeah, I liked it when I read it. I just found it. You know, when I actually learned more, like I just researched what antimatter actually is. So as it turns out, the quantity of antimatter he's talking about is completely, it's like it's like a firecracker amount. Like it's not like a city blow up amount. So that was disappointing. Mm. I got to read that book again. It's been a couple of years. Uh, I don't see myself reading that much fiction, though it just doesn't seem that efficient to me. You're more of a nonfiction guy, right? Correct. And do you predominantly read autobiographies or do you read textbooks as well? I read a lot of textbooks, mostly for my computer science thing. thing. Mm -hmm. And I read autobiographies. I mostly listen to autobiographies, to be honest, like as audiobooks. I think that works very well for biographies, autobiographies, and, you know, like thriller type books like Into the Wind or Into Thin Air. Yeah, you uh, got me into autobiographies. <laughs> yeah, they're a lot of fun and very educational. For like reading, I, I typically prefer like heavier text, for example, um, like uh, The Way to Wealth or, you know, anything that's a little like if you take how to write a good advertisement, that is not something you would want to like listen to. You want to read it. If you take Fooled by Randomness, you want to read it. Zero to One, you want to read it. But even 48 Laws of Power, you want to read it. Deep Nutrition, you want to read it. But Titan, the bag or the biography of Ron Ch John Rockefeller. You want to listen to it. Um, so yeah, it really depends. You know, books that are like a story are pretty good as audiobooks. See, audiobooks are something I still haven't been able to get into, but I'll take your advice on that one. Oh, try it out. Get. I'll send you a copy of the Book of Book audiobooks. You'll like it. Okay, let me try it out. They're a lot of fun and you'll enjoy them. Well, Harsh, this was a great episode. We talked about a variety of topics. How'd you enjoy it? It was a lot of fun. I, fun. I learned a lot. And as usual, it's always great speaking with you. Thanks, Harsh. And likewise, I always learn more stuff from you. I'm looking forward to the next episode. Till next time, my friend. Likewise, have a good day, Arman. I will see you in two, three weeks. Sounds good. And if you guys are looking to hear more from Harsh Strongman, Life Math Money, all his links will be in the description box right on below. And you can just go on lifemathmoney.com and hear more from him. And my links will be in the description box right on below as well. And you can learn more about me at armanitalks.com. Thank you very much. 
until next time make sure you guys click like and subscribe and hit the notification bell you know uh, when we mentioned the whole thing about doing courses i'm currently doing a course called youtube secrets and that course says that people who say hit like comment and subscribe like hit like and subscribe and hit the notification bell tend to get way more subscribers and that's because people just forget to subscribe so click the subscribe button there we go the class is coming clutch <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good Harsh. We'll catch up next time. See you. Okay, bye.